Welcome to our last Deeper Look video of our semester. We have a lot of amazing content coming up in our final module, um, but this is the last video in this format that we're going to need. So our goal for this particular Deeper Look is to investigate all these different pieces of information that we've learned about a star, from how a star forms, to what it leaves behind when it dies, to any interesting things that can happen to its stellar remnant. And we want to be able to organize that in a way that brings together all of these different things we've been talking about into one consistent flow chart that allows us to see what it is that is determining whether a star makes a black hole at the end of its life or not. What types of stars or what piece of information is necessary to determine whether it will create a planetary nebula at the end of its lifetime. So we're going to get started at the very beginning. Uh, I'm not going to put a title on this or anything, but what we are going to do is fill this whole board as a flowchart. And I strongly encourage you to follow along in your notebook and do the same thing, where you might add more words to describe uh, what's going on, because you could put this across multiple pages. I'm limited to this particular space, uh, and so I'm going to simplify things, what I write down, and elaborate in words itself. So I encourage you to always pause and rewind anything that you didn't quite catch the first time. So we want to start at the very beginning, uh, which is uh, a cloud of gas and dust. Because stars can't form out of nothing, and we started this module thinking about these clouds of gas and dust. We gave them the term nebulae. Uh, we learned about the different types of nebula that exist uh, and lots of details about the interstellar medium, that term to describe all of the stuff in between stars. And we want to recognize that if we have that cloud of gas and dust, it will collapse if we are on track to make a star into a protostar. Because we want to include this term in our, um, in our flow chart to recognize that there is something specific necessary to call a star a star. And as that cloud of ga gas and dust collapses, it will start to create a system that looks like it's going to make a star. There's a big central object. There's this disk of material, the protoplanetary disk, which is where exoplanets can form. But it is only once the core of that protostar has collapsed to a high enough density and high enough temperature to turn on fusion in the core that we finally get a main sequence star. And we learned this term for main sequence stars. We learned this term for main sequence stars um, this idea of the main sequence being a place on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, but it is describing the phase of a star's life where it is doing normal star things. And important for our understanding, and you can add it to your flowchart if you want, that the point at which we go from a protostar to main sequence star is hydrogen to helium fusion turns on. And that's what creates a main sequence star. A main sequence star will be 90% of a star's lifetime. And in the process of turning hydrogen into helium, the core is filling up with helium. The star is shining with light and heat. Um, but at some point, there is no more, or not enough, no more hydrogen in the core. There is still plenty in the outer layers, but there's no more hydrogen in the core. And so this star runs out of this nice balance between gravity trying to pull inwards and pressure trying to push out that we called hydrostatic equilibrium, and it leaves the main sequence. And we have talked in different um, formats and different resources that it leaves the main sequence to become bigger overall. Those outer layers expand, and as they expand, they cool off. And so we get um, a red giant phase. And I'll make a small note here that that red giant could be a supergiant, it could be an orange supergiant, but we're still thinking about it getting colder and larger, which is why that is the relevant term that we want to, to use here. 
And I want us to recognize that in general, um, all of those steps will happen to all stars. Um, that's a broad sweeping statement, and uh, it, it is rarely true that when you get into the nitty gritty details um, of real life that a broad sweeping statement is, is fully true, but for our purposes, all of the stars that matter to us without um, talking about the tiniest stars that are barely stars to begin with, they will leave the main sequence and become bigger um, and colder, and we're going to call that the red giant stage. Now, from there, two different things can happen. And I want us to recognize that um, those two different things are based on a star's mass. There's one possibility for low mass stars. So for low mass stars, and we're going to call that less than about 10 solar masses, we want to recognize that that is a rounded value. Um, the detailed physics gets into um, some technical details and 8 to 10 is a common range that you'll see in textbooks and other resources. So we're rounding that number. But for low mass stars, as they leave um, the red giant phase, they will be able to turn on helium to carbon fusion. So there's going to be a brief helium to carbon fusion in the core. So that's less a specific object and more of a phase, but uh, I wanted to make sure that we continued to see the flow chart. But once that um, helium to carbon fusion runs out, there's nothing else that low mass stars can really turn on. Um, so that is when those stars can no longer support themselves against the pull of gravity inwards. Um, and then as that core heats up because the, um, it's getting pulled together, the outer layers see that uh, hotter core and they expand. And so what we have is the outer layers are lost. So outer layers are lost as a planetary nebula. I'm going to put that in all caps because that is a key step for us. And it is a, we can say object left behind because we can point at pictures of things in astronomy and say that thing that we have taken a picture of is a planetary nebula. It's a visible remnant of the outer layers of the star. But what that means is the um, exposed core is now very hot and very small, and we call it a white dwarf. And again, that is a key object that we can point to. Um, so here's our flow chart of what will happen. And I want us to recognize that the sun is a low mass star, so it will have brief helium to carbon fusion in its core. Its outer layers will eventually leave behind a planetary nebula, and then its exposed core, once we are able to see it because the outer layers are gone, will be called a white dwarf. This is the most common track that stars um, can travel on. However, we know that that's not the only thing that happens. For high mass stars, so for higher masses, so that's going to be greater than 10, and again, that's a rounded value, we will have helium to carbon fusion, then a bunch more fusion, I'm just going to write some dots, and then we end with fusion to iron. Iron is Fe in the periodic table. Okay, so we have this kind of alignment. Um, it, they will turn on helium to carbon fusion, but they will continue in these kind of multiple stages of fusion in the core. This is all core fusion that we're talking about. And they end um, this process, this set of phases, um, when they make iron. 
and that idea of making iron is really important for us to understand um, from the lecture slides that iron is the most tightly bound nucleus. It won't give you any extra energy if you put iron together through fusion into making something bigger. Um, and because we're doing fusion in order to power ourselves against gravity, we have to know that at some point we run out of profits, uh, we run out of gain, and it's at iron where that happens. So the outer layers Rather than kind of gently puffing off as a planetary nebula, they go supernova, kaboom. Uh, and we'll talk about um, the type 1A that we learned about in a second later. But this is a type 2 supernova. Okay. So a type 2 supernova is a high mass star that um, has exploded its outer layers. Now here's the important thing, and this is something that we explored also um, in the lecture discussion. High mass stars are all gonna make this type two supernova when they make iron, but based on how much mass is still left in their core, there are two different things that could happen. And so I want us to recognize that up here, the exposed core is going to be less than 1.4 solar masses. So for this type 2 supernova, if we have a core that is 1.4 to about 3 solar masses, then we will leave behind a neutron star. And those neutron stars, when we learned about them, the, um, the supernova is this blasting um, in an outward direction. Because of this shock wave that happens uh, when the neutron star, the core which was uh, regular atoms with nuclei of protons and ne uh, neutrons with electrons uh, there as well, everything gets condensed down. All of the protons plus electrons make neutrons and neutrinos. Uh, and so that neutron star is not really a star. Uh, that's the name that it has, so we're going to stick with that name. But it is this ball of neutrons um, that is roughly the size of a city. The white dwarf is roughly the size of um, Earth. Uh, and the neutron star is crunched down way more um, to be almost the size of a city while being more mass. And then if the core is bigger than three solar masses, so this is the core is bigger than three solar masses, then we leave behind a black hole. Everyone's favorite mysterious astronomy thing. And it's worth recognizing that if we have a core that is about three solar masses, our original star was about 40 solar masses. And those are already extremely rare stars to create. And so black holes are the rarest of these three um, of these three stellar remnants. And I'm going to kind of uh, highlight again um, these three terms because they are the three end states of any given of any given star. It's those three possibilities, and those are called stellar remnants. We talk about that term in class. So when we look at our flowchart, it looks like there's a lot of empty space here, and that's because we're going to be talking about some of these details next. But I do want you to be able to pause and um, think about what is here so far, because this is the level that is kind of really, truly the, the most essential part of our um, understanding of stellar evolution. The stuff that we're going to add allows us to tie in a lot of the other details that we've been exploring. But these are some of the most important things. So I'm going to step out briefly so that you've got this. Maybe you can pause the video, make sure you've got it all listed. And then we're going to fill in the rest um, together. All right. So the things that we talked about um, that are missing are um, like we talked about type 2 supernova, but we talked about type 1 supernova first. 
We also talked about that smaller flash that astronomers had originally seen, a nova, which is why a bigger flash became a supernova. We want to add those things. And we want to talk about some of the other terms that we have talked about for the way astronomers learned more about neutron stars and black holes, thinking about pulsars and X-ray binaries. So that's our big goal here. So we're going to start with the white dwarf track. For a white dwarf, if it is um, without a companion, so no binary companion, then it will slowly cool. It'll be a slowly cooling white dwarf. And that will be what it does. And that's what the sun is going to do for eternity. Um, and there is a term uh, for a white dwarf that is cooled so much it's no longer glowing. The same way that if I left a um, mug of tea on a table, hot tea, it would eventually cool and not be very delicious anymore. But that slowly cooling white dwarf eventually will no longer give off visible light and we would call it a black dwarf. The universe is not old enough yet to have any black dwarfs, so it's not a very useful term because there's no object we can point to and say, that's a black dwarf. So I'm not going to write it down, but you could if you felt like it. Uh, we're not going to ne need it for our curriculum. If we do have a binary companion, then we will go through the process of accretion when that binary companion um, when that binary companion goes through its red giant phase when the binary companion gets really big and fills its space around that additional star it will have extra material that kind of flows onto the white dwarf and we get to gain extra material from there there are two things that can happen then when we have gained extra material if we have stayed below that 1.4 solar mass threshold, then we might gain enough material to um, have material on the outer surface of that white dwarf experiencing very hot, dense um, environment. And we'll have a flash of fusion called the nova. And then that can repeat and it can go back to accretion and we can have this nova come back multiple times, however much we want to. And if and that process will end once the binary companion is no longer giving material and then we'll go back to being a slowly cooling white dwarf. Or if the white dwarf surpasses this 1.4 solar mass limit, then we can get a type 1A supernova. All right. And that type 1A supernova will completely destroy the star, and there will be nothing left. So I guess I can add that um, here. There will be nothing left. I'm going to have very little spot to put my uh, face. Nothing left. So the white dwarf itself is completely destroyed. So those different things that can happen for a white dwarf um, are explored when we talked about um, how low mass stars die. These type 1a supernova are extremely important to astronomers because they are part of what we'll eventually talk about in module 6 is called the distance ladder being able to know that that type 1a supernova is the same kind of object with the same amount of mass exploding every single time allows astronomers to use it as what's called a standard candle um, similar to if you had a whole bunch of light bulbs um, that were lit uh, that you knew were all 100 watts the same brightness then if you had this big empty room and you saw some were brighter and some were dimmer, you would know the bright ones are near your face and the dim ones are far away from your face. And you can figure out the distance with that understanding. So type 1a supernova continue to be important to us um, in the next module. All right, so let's talk about neutron stars and black holes. Very little that we want to add here because we also have very little space. 
Um, for neutron stars, if they are highly magnetized, so highly magnetic and fast rotating, and we're not going to talk about the details of what causes that because that's way outside the scope of our class. But if they are highly magnetic and fast rotating, then it is a neutron star specifically that we are talking about when we use the term pulsar. And we talked about in the slides the discovery of neutron stars, that pulsars are a really important part of that discovery process, which is why they continue to be useful for us to um, add to our understanding here in this flowchart. But we want to recognize that um, not all neutron stars are able to be pulsars. The rest of them are just kind of hidden away. And then black holes um, have the same split that white dwarfs do, that if they are, um, have no companion, so no binary companion, then they are hidden. I don't know. There's not, that's not a fancy um, science term, but it is, it is hard for us to find them. Um, but if they have a binary companion, and this is the last thing we're going to add here, so if there is a binary companion, then we can get accretion and an X-ray disk. And what we mean by that is for that X-ray binary system, uh, accretion is creating this hot swirling material that is not yet inside the black hole. And all of that stuff can kind of shear and, um, and slowly fall towards the black hole and create these big jets of X-ray material that again, this kind of stuff is less important to our curriculum, but is relevant to the way that astronomers can actually observe these things which the idea of making observations to test our theories is absolutely essential to our curriculum. So it's why we bring them up. Pulsars are the observational type of neutron star, and X-ray binaries for black holes are the observational um, type of black holes. Otherwise, they're hidden. So we now have lots and lots of stuff here. There is nothing left to say. Um, and so I shall uh, leave the screen so that you can copy down anything else that you wanted to. Remember, you can always uh, play back the video to uh, hear me say again anything that I missed. Uh, and the last thing I'll say before I go off screen is I want us to note that some of the most important splits here, uh, low mass stars versus high mass stars, the cores after a type 2 supernova, and even what happens um, in accretion of a white dwarf, are splits based on mass. Mass is the single most important thing that determines what will happen to a star. So think about that, maybe write that down, um, and then look back at your flowchart to, to really see that in action. Uh, thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next video.